Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching a special edition of The Listening Post. It's been 20 years since Operation Desert Storm, when an American-led coalition took Kuwait back from Iraq's Saddam Hussein. We're going to look back at the media's role in the selling of the 1991 Gulf War. They took the babies out of the incubators. The U.S. military's attempts to control the narrative. I apologize for the busy nature of this chart, but I think it's very important. And the round-the-clock coverage that changed television news forever. We're seeing bright flashes going off all over the sky. In the second half of the program, we'll get to the groundbreaking coverage of the 1991 war and some novel approaches the Pentagon took to control the way the media reported that story. First, though, we're going to focus on what was on television and in print in the five months between August 1990, when Iraqi forces invaded Kuwait, and January 1991, when the bombs started falling on Baghdad. The first President Bush said he was drawing a line in the sand, that the invasion of Kuwait would not be tolerated. But the U.S. administration had to sell a war in a distant region and convince skeptics at home, as well as in the countries that made up the coalition, that the war was about more than just oil, that a former American ally, Saddam Hussein, was now a danger to Western interests. The administration had some help. A group of Kuwaitis with deep pockets hired a Washington-based public relations firm called Hill & Knowlton to help portray Saddam as a menace. Our starting point this week is the PR campaign that became a case study in how to rally people through the media and get them behind a controversial cause, the first Gulf War. And it's clear the Kuwaitis fought hard to resist Iraqi troops. A British cameraman, Kevin Hayden, recorded the following pictures from his apartment in Kuwait City on the day of the invasion. August 2nd, 1990, the day Iraqi tanks rolled into Kuwait and turned a dispute between neighbors over historical borders and unpaid loans into an international crisis. The United States strongly condemns uh, the Iraqi military invasion of Kuwait. There is no place for this sort of naked aggression in today's world. Do you uh, contemplate intervention as one of your options? We're, we're not discussing intervention. I would not discuss any military options. In the initial hours after the invasion, President Bush's tone was tempered. But just a few months later, he was sounding like a wartime president. We're not walking away until our mission is done, until the invader is out of Kuwait. So how did George Bush go from hoping that a peaceful solution will be found to we will not let this aggression stand? And how did Saddam Hussein, who in the 1980s was an American ally, get rebranded as the second coming of Adolf Hitler? Well, early on, as the Bush administration realized that it was going to have a hard time selling uh, the Gulf War uh, or the invasion of Kuwait to the American people, uh, Vietnam was still fresh in people's memories. The Kuwaitis were not a very sympathetic lot. They were immensely wealthy. So they created something called Citizens for a Free Kuwait, funded entirely by the Kuwaiti government in exile, but which purported to be a homegrown American nonprofit. One of the first moves citizens for a free Kuwait made was to hire Hill and Knowlton, a PR firm. Hill and Knowlton is by far the biggest, most influential PR firm in Washington. Countries with a PR problem are their specialty. Hill and Knowlton had the task of finding the marketing strategy, the, the frame that would encourage the American public and even more importantly the United States Congress to accept the idea that the United States needed to be militarily involved in the Persian Gulf in a war against Iraq. Hill and Knowlton did that by working the media, producing video press releases highlighting the plight of Kuwaitis, arranging meetings with newspaper editorial boards, even facilitating free Kuwait movements on college campuses. For their efforts, the Kuwaitis paid Hill and Knowlton $10.8 million. All the while, the media were reporting on the growing U.S. military force in the Gulf. The first pictures this morning of American troops on the ground in Saudi Arabia. In order to then make the case for invasion, because they could see it was going to be a very close vote in the Congress about authorizing the war, they had to come up with some spectacular excuses for going to war. So they arranged with the Congressional Human Rights Caucus to hold hearings on the alleged atrocities being committed by Iraqi troops in Kuwait. 
and their star witness was a 15-year-old girl who was identified only as Naira. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Naira, and I just came out of Kuwait. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators, and left the children to die on the cold floor. It made big headlines, and uh, that whole image is still now, 20 years later, it's awful, it's disgusting, it's terrible. And since the Iraqis basically did rape Kuwait, people thought this is quite possible. The story grew, it became, it inflated like a balloon, and before you knew it, it was hundreds of babies. Amnesty International had put its imprimatur on the report. President George Bush had used it in speeches over and over again. And they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. This story was uh, sort of a turning point. It was a key moment in the, the developing reason as to why the United States felt it was so important to go to war with Iraq. It, it provided a moral impetus. It was the, the, the morality play of the entire narrative. The incubator story was attracting a lot of attention, so Iraq's Minister of Information, Naji Hadithi, wanted to debunk it. He offered CNN the chance to visit hospitals in Kuwait. He said, but there are certain ground rules. You'll have all the freedom you want to interview any of the hospital personnel, but you cannot report on anything militarily. Well, I thought it over, and I figured Look, we don't want to be used to cover up possible atrocities, so if they were going to allow us to go to six hospitals, we would have a, a pretty good idea of what was going on. However, the CNN crew only got to do one interview before their handlers rushed them back to the Iraqi capital. That scene was dramatized in the film Live from Baghdad. Finish, finish, we go now. What, to the other hospital? No, no, back to Baghdad. Hey, hey, that was part of the deal. That is story. As we were driving to catch our flight to uh, Baghdad, the BBC was already reporting that CNN had been to Kuwait and determined no babies had been thrown out of incubators. Well, we were obviously being used by the Iraqis. They were being used, but that didn't change the fact that Nayira's testimony was a complete charade. As it turned out, no babies died the way the Nayira said they did. Nobody knew when she was testifying, and no one knew until I revealed it uh, a year later, that she was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to Washington. Obviously, very unlikely she was in Kuwait City after the invasion. Um, and also uh, very unlikely uh, that she knew anything about conditions inside Kuwait. John MacArthur broke the story in the New York Times, then the Canadian program, The Fifth Estate, followed it up with the Kuwaiti ambassador. If I wanted to lie, or if we wanted to lie, or we wanted to exaggerate, I wouldn't use uh, my daughter to do so. I could easily buy other people to do it. CBS's 60 Minutes grilled Lori Fitzpagato, a Hill and Knowlton executive and former officer of the U.S. Information Agency. How can you say you're not working for the government of Kuwait? Our client was Citizens for a Free Kuwait. Our checks came from Citizens for a Free Kuwait. Well, that's just I have no information about the source of their funding. That funding had one purpose, to get a lethargic American public to support intervention and a war against Iraq. And it worked, not on its own, but together with speculative news reports that Saddam Hussein might invade Saudi Arabia next, that Israel might be targeted with his chemical or biological weapons, the story told by a 15-year-old girl helped win public support for what would come to be known as Operation Desert Storm. And by the time the news media told the world the truth about the incubators, Nayira and citizens for a free Kuwait, Baghdad had been bombed Kuwait had been liberated, and the first Gulf War was already over. And here's what our Global Village voices have to say about the media side of the build-up to the 1991 war. It was the first war since the Vietnam War, really, and uh, 
I, I think I was just amazed at how obsequious most of the press corps were in, in following government cues. It was not considered uh, kosher <laughs> to uh, disagree with whatever the government was telling you. In the run-up to war, the Western media reported uncritically a whole series of alleged uh, incidents of atrocities by uh, Iraqis in Kuwait, many of which turned out not to be true. And so they were complicit in creating the mood music um, for the war in the first place. We're back after the break with part two of our special on the 1991 war in the Gulf. Pentagon personalities, rock star reporters, and bombs over Baghdad. Welcome back to a Listening Post special on the media and the 1991 Gulf War. When the UN imposed a deadline for Iraq to withdraw from Kuwait passed on January 15th that year, war became inevitable. And most news outlets with reporters in the Iraqi capital pulled them out. The coverage that ensued, live shots of bombs exploding in the Baghdad night, Tomahawk missiles blasting off American warships, transfixed audiences worldwide. However, the journalism left plenty to be desired. The Pentagon kept reporters at a distance, and the pool system that it used to do that has since developed into the embedded reporter model that's used in Afghanistan and Iraq today. And a 24-hour news channel, one of the very few that existed in 1991, wrote its wall-to-wall -wall coverage of a war that lasted just six weeks and changed the news game forever. Here's the Listening Post's Jason Mojica on the way the war was covered and the impact that has had on journalism in the two decades since. The clerk will repeat the votes of senators as they are recorded. By January of 1991, when the U.S. Congress passed a resolution authorizing the use of force against Iraq, the largest American military buildup since the Vietnam War had been underway for months. In my direction, elements of the 82nd Airborne Division, as well as key units of the United States Air Force, are arriving today to take up defensive positions in Saudi Arabia. With the momentum of more than 500,000 troops assembled in Saudi Arabia, war looked inevitable, and the media were determined not to miss a moment of it. One tiny sweet potato and a little bit of corn. Good to see you, fellas. The Pentagon, however, had other ideas. Uh, the ground rules are that the pool is under the wing of the Pentagon. They take us in country and we follow their rules or we don't get to come. In Vietnam, you could hop onto any uh, vehicle from a jeep to a helicopter to an airplane and go wherever you want and do whatever you want. And the military learned a, a lesson from that, that the press was not always reporting things in their favor. The Marines have burned this old couple's cottage because fire was coming from here. In the Gulf War, for the first time since World War II, they organized reporters into pools. And as the pool reporter, uh, you would then report back to the other reporters and tell them what you saw. But anything you saw or wrote had to be first cleared with the Pentagon and was occasionally censored. The ground rules in the use of pools was uh, a compromise. To some extent, we were trying to overcome a 25-year-old perception of the press on the part of many military commanders whose previous experience in combat had been Vietnam when there was a lot of mistrust between reporters and the military. When the, the Pentagon said you're going to be in pools or you're not going to cover the war, the American news media crumpled. The only person who didn't really crumple was Ted Turner at CNN. Now more than ever, shouldn't you be watching CNN International? It was in my mind, uh, an opportunity for CNN, being a 24-hour network, to really strut its stuff, and it was a, a story that was tailor-made for us. Does Stuart get his milk? Yes. Were we used by the Iraqis? Yes. Did we use the Iraqis? Yes. Meanwhile, in Saudi Arabia, reporters tried to provide the best coverage they could, sometimes resorting to reporting on themselves. If this was a battle, the reporters would be staying as long as two weeks, sending their reports back via military couriers. With pools limited to reporters from major broadcast and print outlets, independent journalists, the so-called unilaterals, were forced to improvise. I applied for 
accreditation with the British Army, with the French Army, with the American Army. I didn't even get an answer from any of them. And I was so incensed that my apparent opportunity had gone that I started getting all my old uniforms out, thinking, right, I'm, I'm going to you know, go out there and try and get in with the Army. Self-embed. On the evening of January 16th, the UN deadline had expired, and the bombing of Baghdad began. I've told the American people before that this will not be another Vietnam. Our troops will have the best possible support in the entire world, and they will not be asked to fight with one hand tied behind their back. The initial bombardment wreaked havoc on communications. Uh, a lesser... Whoops. We have indeed lost uh, communications, not only from Baghdad at the moment, but also from eastern uh, Saudi Arabia. Something is happening outside. Only one news network was still broadcasting live from Baghdad. We now have on the telephone from downtown Baghdad, a hotel there, the very enterprising Bernard Shaw, representing the very enterprising CNN. Yes, Tom, I'm fine. Uh, I'm sitting in a chair for a change. I've been crawling on the floor for the last two, three hours. When the war began, we were the only network that could transmit directly from behind the lines in real time. How did CNN manage to stay on the air during all this? Bernie Shaw? Uh, Tom, let me take a pass on your question, and the next time I see you, uh, I'll explain profusely. We had sought and gotten permission from the Iraqis to install a special communications line called the Four Wire that was not vulnerable to uh, bombing. We can say now that nothing has landed very near the hotel. Oh, that's sort of like a rocket. Even though there's lots close. of noise, but yeah. the rocket, I think, was going up and not coming at us, John. <laughs> it was CNN's uh, big moment, and uh, we were no longer considered chicken noodle news. In spite of the groundbreaking reporting on the opening of the war, the coverage in the weeks that followed focused largely on the air campaign, false alarms, and live military briefings far from the battlefield. What could best be described as the Hail Mary play in football, I think you Schwarzkopf, the he realized there's no need for me to put out press releases, uh, which the news media can then mangle or reinterpret uh, as they wish. I'll just speak directly over them. So he held live press conferences on a regular basis where he used gun camera shots, which the American media just ate up like crazy. I'm now going to show you a picture of the luckiest man in Iraq. Look at here, right through the crosshairs. And now in his rear view mirror. <laughs> By the end of February, it was all over. Kuwait is liberated. Iraq's army is defeated. Our military objectives are met. The Gulf War lasted just six weeks, but it changed the face of news forever. In the Arab world, it led to a growing dissatisfaction with state-controlled media. All you would get is what the president of that country did for that day and who he met with and which ambassador supported the, 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 the Arab cause. and, and you know, it wasn't really news. And so CNN comes along and, and everybody watched CNN, whether they liked it or not. And soon, Arabic language 24-hour news networks were available across the Middle East. For Western audiences, the effects of the media's coverage of the Gulf War proved less beneficial. Technology has dominated the airways. It was a war where you hear a lot of editors and you hear a lot of people look back at and say, you know, that's how, that's how the news shouldn't cover a war. That's how we don't want to do it. Because of the 1991 Gulf War and the restrictions accepted by the American media imposed by the Pentagon, we haven't had a real independently covered war since. These days, reporters are even more dependent on the military. They routinely embed with frontline forces, trading independence for access and a one-sided view of the fighting. 20 years after the 1991 war, the media are still struggling to get it right. It's important to cover war and not sanitize war coverage. So one would hope that mankind will learn a lesson and wars can be prevented. Unfortunately, we still haven't learned that lesson.
More Global Village voices now on what the world saw of the 1991 Gulf War. And a very important media lesson from the 91 Gulf War is that it really set an extremely low bar of expectation for journalism in the United States, primarily because it was in that war that the Pentagon really started uh, with the embed program where really we have the American perspective, but no perspective on how civilians or the other side is being affected. I'm watching this stuff and they had all this night vision photography and, and these bombs. It was very video game looking. There was the Iraq of the CNN, and then there was the real Iraq. And I wasn't seeing the real Iraq. Finally, finding a relevant web video of the week related to a war that preceded the internet age was not easy, but we've got one for you. NBC's Saturday Night Live was not a new show in 1991. It had already been on the air for 15 years, and it's still going strong today. Back then, the show's writers thought the behavior of some over-eager war reporters in search of headlines was worth parodying. Watch closely and you'll see the fresh face of relative youth in the form of Mike Myers, Dana Carvey and Conan O'Brien. You've been watching our special edition on the 20th anniversary of the 1991 Gulf War. We'll see you next time at the Listening Post. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have with the understanding that there are certain sensitive areas that I'm just not going to get into particularly information that might be useful to the enemy. Uh, what date are we going to start the ground attack? <laughs> well, as I mentioned a moment ago, there are certain sensitive areas which we are just not going to go into, and that is certainly one of them. Colonel, knowing what you know, where would you say our forces are most vulnerable to attack, and how could the Iraqis best exploit those weaknesses? Excuse me, Colonel. If I could interrupt here, I just want to underscore what Colonel Pearson said at the start of Q&A. There are two general categories of questions that we are simply not going to be able to address. One, those that would give our enemy advance warning of our actions. And two, those that would identify any points of weakness or vulnerability to the Iraqi forces. So let's reopen the floor to questions. Are we planning an amphibious invasion of Kuwait? And if so, where? 